uh, calculating essentially a return on an ergonomic investment. This is a topic that I would say almost uh, all of our clients um, and pretty much every company we've ever worked with uh, do poorly in general. Um, and it's not necessarily a reflection of lack of effort or energy. Um, it's probably more that it's not easy to do. And so um, it, it tends to be something that gets overlooked. Not all of our clients uh, are great at numbers, right? They're not salespeople. They're not necessarily you know, accountants. They don't look at numbers the same way. And so as a result, this part of your program often gets overlooked, which is not ideal. So we want to take a look at this today and talk briefly about um, uh, we want to take a, uh, sorry, we want to take a look at this briefly today and just talk about some ways that we can do this. And ideally, I'm going to talk about some ways that we can do this in what I would describe as a more complicated way and also some ways we can do this in, that are relatively simple and straightforward. Specifically, I want to focus on two of our clients that sort of took this on um, and were able to provide us with some ongoing numbers. You can see what data they are uh, were able to compile and how they were able to use that to their advantage. So I'll show you two specific case studies throughout the day. So again, go ahead and ask questions as you go. Uh, I was involved in both projects, so I can certainly speak to the, the elements of each. Oh. So we're going to talk very briefly about workplace injuries. I think that's always a place we have to start when we're talking about return on investment because in many cases, uh, workplace injuries are one of the areas that you are going to prevent uh, and therefore ultimately reduce, uh, like you'll see your return on investment in injury reduction. So we need to talk about that. Uh, but not forget about the other elements, right? There are, there are a lot of positive benefits. Um, hold on one second here. Oh, I think we're okay. Sorry about that. So ultimately, I don't want to forget about the uh, the workplace injuries, but I also want you to focus on more than just that, right? If we can do an ergonomic event intervention that not only reduces injuries but also uh, improves productivity, so now we save. If you know, if you're in a manufacturing type environment and you save three seconds per cycle because we've made that process more efficient, and ultimately meant that they can um, that that employee doesn't have to reach as far or they don't have to handle that part twice for example, that ultimately all of that savings can also be um, can also be a, a positive return on investment as well, which again, we don't always do a good job calculating. I get, your engineers might do a better job of that, but typically our health and safety folks, our HR folks, aren't doing as good a job at calculating those numbers. So we're going to talk about two specific uh, programs that, ergon that Progonomics has worked with our clients on. Like I said, there'll be two specific case studies sort of throughout the session here. So nationally, musculoskeletal disorders or ergonomic injuries are still the most costly medical condition in Canada, uh, and that is still consistently true. We are seeing decreases in those numbers here, and I'll uh, show you some WSAB stats in a minute here. We are seeing some decreases in frequency, which is great, uh, but ultimately we are not, we're still not where we need to be, right? So we're still seeing estimated annual costs of greater than $20 billion, um, and that doesn't necessarily account for the human cost, so the cost of livelihood, chronic pain, right? These are calculable costs. So these are lost time. These are um, WSIB premiums. These are retraining costs. That kind of thing. We're not actually ca calculating sort of the, the the broader scale of this. So that's not always a great uh, a great evaluator as well. It probably is a lot higher than that when you consider the other elements. A lost time injury claim on average, and again, this is going to vary de greatly depending on whether what type of injury we're talking about, but on average, a lost time injury claim costs an employer approximately $30,000. That's an average, so some of them are going to be quite a bit less than that, uh, but some of them are going to be quite a bit more, right? So, And then we also have additional legal fees associated with claims, training for temporary or new hires, uh, you have less experts on the job, um, obviously those things all you know factor into the cost of the claim. The WSIB still indicates that, whoa, hold on a second. Let's try that again. Let's see if we can get this back. There we go. Okay, so Schedule 1 injury statistics. So uh, these are uh, getting a bit dated now. We're waiting for some new data to come out here, and it will shortly. 
but ultimately um, we're still looking at approximately 40% of our workplace injuries are for Schedule 1 employers are sprains and strains. And ultimately what that means is that that's still uh, more than two-thirds of your, or more than a third, excuse me, of your workplace injuries, almost a half. It used to be a half. It has come down a little bit, but are still uh, a, major, uh, a major issue, and they are ergonomic injuries. So obviously ergonomic intervention has a positive opportunity to improve these, and then if you, can, if you personally at your site can get those down below 40% or below you know, whatever number you're at right now, then you are going to see a return on investment. The question is how do we calculate that well? Um, overexertion is still one of the main causes, so that's still one of the major factors to, con to consider, which is absolutely ergonomic related. Uh, the Schedule 2 injury statistics, if you're a Schedule 2 employer, and I believe we do have a few of those on here with us today, numbers are a little bit higher. So Schedule 2 employers, the sprains and strains, or what I would consider to be mostly ergonomic injuries, are greater than, are greater than uh, Schedule 1 employers, they're upwards of 47%, and overexertion, again, is still one of the main or the leading causes here. So this tends to be an area that we could all easily focus and see a positive return. We just have to do a figure out how we're actually going to calculate that. Ultimately, ergonomics can help. I think we all know that, uh, right? That, that's why you're here. Ergonomics improves safety performance because we're preventing injuries in theory. Uh, it increases company morale. It increases productivity, quality of work. Uh, reduces those injuries, reduces claim costs, sort of all of those connected elements, and many more things. I could ask for you guys to draft a list for me right now, and you'd probably come up with 10 other things to go on that list. Right? We know ergonomics can help. The question is, how do we calculate it well? So let's have a look at one of our clients who uh, did a, what I would consider actually quite a good job at calculating this. Um, they track some numbers. Ultimately, the interesting part is they have some really fabulous numbers, but haven't been able to put a dollar amount to it, or have chosen not to, perhaps is a better way to think about it, is they haven't made it a priority to put a dollar number to this. So I'm going to give you a whole bunch of numbers, and then we're going to talk about how you could use those numbers to create a dollar value, but they have not done that. They have not done that final step to actually calculate a true return on investment, but they have all the numbers that we would like to see you sort of calculating and compiling. So this case study is a manufacturing environment. Uh, they track their not they have they have historical data on the number of injuries, musculoskeletal disorder specific injuries, um, and so they have those that, that data. Their highest one of their highest numbers occurred in 2011. They had 39 musculoskeletal disorder injuries, which is pretty high. They are a large facility, so that does make a difference. They looked at, okay, they did, they did several sort of their, pro, what the process was in their program is that ultimately they took a look at this and said, okay, this is a major issue for us. So in 2011, they had us come in and do ergonomic, um, an ergonomic assessment of all their positions. So we looked at all the different jobs at their facility, identify what the hazards were, and then evaluated, evaluated risk for all the positions. So ultimately what we found in that assessment is that they had 295 identi identified areas of risk or things to focus on uh, in order to reduce this overall number of 39 injuries. Um, as of December 2016, when I talked to them to get this data, um, they had identified or sorry, addressed 158 of those items. So they were down to somewhere around 140 left on their list, which is a pretty significant reduction, right? They basically have the number of hazards that were present by act proactively addressing these. They did all of that element in-house. We did the actual assessment of risk and evaluation of that, but they did all their tracking in-house, and they had an ergonomics team which was responsible for leading uh, interventions throughout the facility on all of these different elements. So ultimately in 2000, so they, had, they had the same, essentially the same number of injuries in 2010. So 30, about 39 injuries in 2010, 2011, they had an inter, their intervention, their ergonomic intervention. They hired us to identify all their hazards and risks and, uh, and, and work with their ergonomics committee on training and whatnot. So they had sort of a, a very comprehensive or holistic approach to their training element, but in 2011 is when they introduced this intervention. And you can very easily see from the graph that we've got here that ultimately there was a there was a, a very quick and positive return on their investment in terms of the number of injuries that they were decreased that they de were able to decrease by, right? So uh, if you skim sort of across the list here, their lowest number was in 2013, hovering around that 20 mark, and in 2014, 2015, and now in 2016, which they just had that data as of the end of December, they were hovering around that 21 to 22 uh, injury mark. So that's a reduction of injuries of almost 
uh, 17 to 18, maybe 19, depending on the year, uh, from their peak, which was upwards, uh, was up at that 39 mark. So that's a very significant shift, right, to almost, to very nearly half that, well, it's sort of, it, maybe it's interesting that it corresponds, right? They have the number of risks that were present at their facility by reducing them ultimately from high risk to low or moderate risk. And in and a direct correlation, they had almost half the number of injuries uh, that their employees experienced. Is it a direct correlation? I don't know. There may have been some other factors here. Uh, they did have some pr productivity-wise. There were a couple of years where perhaps they were a little lower than average. Uh, but certainly in 2015, 2016, they've seen a re uh, recovery. So their numbers are right back up to where they were before. Um, and ultimately, they are still seeing this low, lower, significantly lower number of injuries. Right, this isn't the type of facility that is going to get down to zero, right? The road to zero idea uh, that was put out by the WSAB a while ago is not not likely realistic for this client based on the type of work that they do. Um, however, they certainly have been pretty excited by, uh, by de decreasing this by almost 50%. So the client themselves gave this quote. Uh, they said they cannot put a dollar amount to the return on investment of the program, but they can say that the injury reduction alone has saved enormous amounts of money and improved production. So this company whole, wholeheartedly bought into this program. As soon as they started to see those injury risks, uh, those injury numbers drop, uh, they uh, very quickly were able to say, yes, this is a positive return on investment. Now, exactly what that return is in terms of dollar amount, they didn't do a good job of calculating. And that's the area that I would have loved to see them uh, to, to boost up, essentially. It would have been great if they were tracking the ergonomic committee's time right, and investment, right, so that they actually can calculate the number of man hours that went into these interventions. And it would have been great if they, can cal if they could pull those numbers. It cost us to implement a winch here to lift this part or to lift this ramp cost us eight grand to implement a new lift assist here cost us 14. But if they were able to pull those numbers out, that would be really excellent uh, to see how this or all corresponds. But we did some quick, uh, just basic estimates, very basic, right? We said, okay, if uh, you have a reduction of 20 injuries, which is what they had, and we said on average your injuries cost eight to 10,000 per claim, ultimately you're looking at an annual savings of an, uh, somewhere around one hundred and sixty to two hundred thousand dollars. Now, their investment in the program itself was quite was quite significant compared to some of our other clients because of the volume of work that we did there. Um, however, that is still our cost nowhere near touched $160,000. So the cost to have us come in, do the assessments, identify their risks, hazards, get their ergonomics team up and running and on the right track, nowhere near touches that low end of the estimate. So if you're just looking at the intervention cost versus injury cost savings, then they are already above, you know, ahead of the game. And then if they invested the rest of that money in ergonomic intervention, then you know maybe they came out at zero the first year, right? They didn't really have much return on investment the first year because of the intervention cost and because of the equipment cost they installed. But ultimately, that equipment cost and that intervention cost stays the same every year, right? We we don't add to it. My my uh, my involvement with this company has gone down significantly. We still go in periodically if they need help with something, but it's very minor in comparison to what it was that one year. We really blitzed everything. And they have uh, still they would they would be you know be looking at this annually essentially. So if you look at the comparison, there really is no way to say they. I mean, he they, our client has listed there, right? They they know they're saving lots of money. They've just never sat down and actually calculated this. So it had a huge positive return on investment, which is really pretty exciting. They could have also done a better job here of calculating uh, injuries uh, based on the number of. Uh, based on the type of injury, right? So we've just estimated that their, you know, injuries, the injury itself cost eight to 10,000 per claim on average, but, you know, they would be able to tell us how many hand wrist injuries they had. They should be able to tell us or pull out that information about how many shoulder injuries, how many back injuries, and the average cost of each type of injury. So you could actually get a lot more specific here about what uh, the savings would have been if they had said, okay, we actually, you know, of those 20 injuries, we reduced uh, on average, three to four back injuries per year. We've reduced five to six shoulder injuries and 10 to 12 uh, hand wrist injuries. When you look at that, you could have calculated, well, injuries, hand wrist injuries usually cost us six grand per injury. Back injuries cost us 30 per injury and, and sort of work from there and give you some better numbers.
right? So you could get a lot more specific. So they have that data, and they could go probably one step further, but they haven't been uh, compiling it. And you, uh, you mean you saw how many uh, things they've already tackled? It would take them quite some time to go back and gather how much it costs for all these interventions. So I don't think that's a step that they're prepared to take at this moment. But ultimately, they can do this in terms of return on investment from an injury reduction perspective, not necessarily uh, looking at it from a dollars and cents perspective. Ultimately, the cost versus benefit, um, the reason it's so hard to calculate for ergonomic interventions, you probably just saw some of those things, right? The hypothetical nature of the injuries per, you're preventing is one of the biggest issues, right? We, we can look at historical data. We have to look at historical data in order to get that. That's what our previous client did, right? They looked at historical data and said, okay, we've re consistently reduced our injuries by approximately 20 per year since we introduced this ergonomic inter intervention. They could then take that data, figure out what that actually uh, saves them annually, approximately, and then look at what they're spending annually, uh, sort of moving forward on this intervention, and do some quick calculations. Right? But the real problem here is that you're always hypothetical. Um, I don't know before I start. Like They didn't know in 2011 what number of reduction of injuries they're going to have. They might have estimated that they're going to have, you know, reduce injuries by 15 or by 10 or by 12 or by 18, but it would have been an estimate, right? And that's one of the biggest challenges with return on investment for ergonomics is that it is pretty much always an estimate, right? So what is the, how do we calculate that return on investment when we're really estimating what someone's injury reduction is going to be, what a, a client's injury reduction is going to be? So consider the basics of keeping it simple, right? This doesn't have to be highly complex. It can be, and maybe it should be in some cases. But you can do some basics without getting highly complicated. I just gave you some data from our from one of our clients. Uh, ideally, using your specific data on sites, you're going to do some research, right? It's going to take you some legwork to gather all the data you need. But ultimately, we want to see some basics. We want to see your data about number of injuries, average cost per injury, ideally connected to specific types of, it depends on how you classify your injuries, but ultimately by specific body type or, uh, or claim type. So it might be about a manual material handling claim. It might be about a shoulder claim or a wrist claim, depending on how you classify those in your system. But it's best to compare apples to apples. So you do really want to use that shoulder injury data and say and compare that to actual shoulder injury numbers, right? So we, you know, on average, shoulder injuries cost us twelve thousand five hundred, and we estimate we're going to we're going to save or prevent X number of injuries per year. So ultimately, uh, you can do a return on investment sort of in two ways. You can do it as a in many ways when you're building a business case for why you want to implement an expensive piece of equipment. You're going to have to do it up front to some degree, right? And uh, then you can do it this way if you're going to look at that. Again, very simple. This is not a highly complex way, and it's not going to be perfect either. But a very simple way to look at it is think about, okay, what is the cost of an injury uh, to a shoulder? We've seen traditionally shoulder injuries on this specific job, and so we're trying to prevent shoulder injuries ultimately, right? So the cost of the injury is 10,000. The average number of injuries we have on this job per year is five, right? Over the last five years, we've had four or five jobs, four or five injuries per year on this job. And then you have to estimate your injury reduction per percentage. How many injuries do you think you are going to present or prevent? Excuse me. Ultimately, you have to make that call, right? In this case, I've said, okay, let's use a conservative estimate and say we're going to reduce those injuries by likelihood of those injuries by 25%. And you would, I would look at this in a few ways. I, I, the number is is a bit is going to be not perfect. It's not going to. It's I'm going to say. I was going to say it's arbitrary, and it's not 100% arbitrary either. Um, ultimately, I would look at this from a um, an ergonomic risk perspective, right? So you run a risk assessment. Let's say you're going to implement a lift assist. It's one of the easier ones to think about. Right now, they're manually lifting 50-pound boxes and palletizing them. Fabulous. Okay, so I'm going to implement a lift assist, and I'm going to eliminate that lift altogether. So my risk goes from red, right, from high risk down to green because they no longer have to lift it or they only have to lift those boxes once in a while if they have to repack a skid, for example, and the lift assist isn't, uh, it's not possible to use a lift, lift assist for that task. 
So I'm going to readjust that risk uh, rating from a red or a high risk down to a green or a low risk. And in those cases, now I am reducing it probably by more than 25%, right? So you have to sort of figure out what that looks like, but ultimately you're going to estimate what the injury reduction percentage will be and calculate your return on investment. So, uh, so this time, so you, basically you're saying that you think you're going to save 12,500 in this basic math formula I just gave you, 12,500 on this specific intervention. And the intervention is going to, and this is an annual cost, right? So you're going to save 12500 per year. And the intervention itself, you know, implementing that lift assist is going to cost you 15000 So your first year, you're going to save nothing, right? Your first year, you're going to, you're going to save this 12500 but you'll spend $15,000. So you're actually out $2,500 approximately, right, with our basic math. But in future years, all of that money gets recouped. So we start to see that the... Most uh, studies that have done any kind of return on investment look at the uh, time it takes you to start to actually be making money, quote unquote, on the intervention, and it is very short term. For ergonomic related interventions, in many cases, the return can be seen within months, and certainly not within months than within a year or so. And in this specific example I gave, you would see that return in approximately a year, right? That all of a sudden, you'd have a little bit of input first year, but year two and onwards, that lift assist doesn't cost you anything annually anymore, and your return on uh, injury reduction is still going to be 12500 every year, right? You're less, you're less that number of injuries. So uh, ultimately, you can start to calculate when you start to recover or make money off this investment, um, and that really is ideal when you're going to present a business case to a client, right? or to a, to a, a manager, or if I have to present to a client, but ultimately, if you guys have to make a business case to a management team or someone about why you should invest in this, doing some basic calculations like this can start to give you an idea of um, it is hypothetical, but give you an idea of how you can pitch this because a lot of your management team will speak dollars and cents. That's what they look at. That's what they think about. And that's how uh, probably even their performance is driven is based on how much, uh, uh, you know, their effective use of a budget, right? And this can seem like a big expense, but ultimately it can be a big return if they look at it maybe even, you know, from a long-term long -term perspective. Now that said, that's a simple way, right? All we've done is look at it a very simple way. There are a lot more complex and robust ways to do this as well. Uh, one of them that's out there that is probably the most commonly quoted for ergonomic related injuries uh, is the Washington State Cost Benefit Calculator. Uh, it's free, it's publicly available, you can get access to it. And it's a two-step process. The first step of the process is to input workers' compensation expenses. So this is based on injury statistics, average payouts, et cetera. So that's where all of your number-driven his uh, injury history is going to go in. Then you're going to input your cost of your solutions, how much it is going to cost you to put that lift assist in, and then this cal and what the benefits are. Ultimately, it asks you some basic questions, which it has connected to percentage savings. So it asks you... Uh, well, I'll show you in a few in the next few slides. It asks you some basic questions about what it's going to help you do, uh, and then it will assign a percentage reduction to that. So it says, okay, if you're going to, um, well, hold on, I'll show you in a second. Better than me giving hypotheticals. And ultimately, the calculator supplies the benefits and that interesting element of payback timeline. At what point do you start making money on this project? Uh, and it gives you a timeline for that. So this is what the, uh, this calculator looks like. Um, ultimately, what it's doing is showing you the, some of the basic data. It looks at injuries based on type of injury, right? So back strain, shoulder strain, et cetera. So it does break it down a little bit more detail. How many injuries that you had that are like that this year? And uh, typical cost. So it asks you how much it costs per claim and then does some basic math, uh, does some basic math to add that up, right? So it does sort of calculate that for you. It asks you for the number of job employees that are exposed to that job, which is a relevant ta a relevant uh, element to look at. You want to make sure you know how many in employees are going to be exposed to that potential injury risk, and then how much money they're making, et cetera. It's going to ask some basic details. It's going to ask you for that data over several years. So it asks you basically a st looking for three-year historical data, current year, year before, and two years before that, to give you an average annual cost of the claim and an annual indirect cost. So it uses that information and says, okay, we know that direct costs and indirect costs are different, which I apologize I didn't talk about in particular. But direct costs are things like um, 
uh, direct costs are things like uh, you have claim costs, right? You have uh, you have a productivity losses on the day of the event. Uh, those kinds of things. Things are easy, calculatable, and then you have things that are a lot harder to add in, right? And we know that indirect costs, like um, in, uh, um, uh, sorry, my brain is a little slow because it's cold. Um, uh, things that you have to add in, like uh, bah, 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 bah. let's use some good examples here. Oh, like your if you have to have unskilled workers on the job for the next. Uh, five or six days because this employee is off work, that's going to change your production, it's going to change your quality, right, and those things are hard to measure. You're going to have to investigate this injury, uh, or someone is going to have to investigate this injury. We don't calculate that time typically into our injury, into our direct cost. So there are other factors that go into that that ultimately uh, will estimate what our direct and indirect costs associated with this, preventing an injury like this is. Once you're done with that, it asks you what you're going to do. So it's asking you for your input solution. So in this example, they've, option one is to implement job rotation, and option two is, in, is to implement a pallet lifter. And so ultimately, option one, there isn't a whole lot of cost to, right? It's not equipment. It's just tools. So it, it's just a, a management strategy. So ultimately, there's no purchasing cost. There's no engineering cost. The training is approximately, they've estimated $400. You know, you put whatever number in is in there. And then it asks you what the effectiveness of the solution is. So it basically is going to give you a percentage injury reduction based on how effective it is. So it asks you if it eliminates the hazard. If it does, then that's fabulous it's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, right? If it reduces the level of exposure, that's fine. If it reduces the time of exposure, which would what job rotation would do, then that goes in there. It requires employee behavior, like you're training them on a new work method, for example, that goes there, or if you're not expecting any injury change because of this. Option two is a pallet lift. It costs more money. All right, so they put in the number of $5,500 here, so that's the cost of purchasing. You'd also want per potentially cost of engineering or installation, et cetera. Right, so you want the overall cost in there. And then ultimately it reduces the level of exposure. So it's going to take that information and a lot, what's nice about this one is it allows you to have multiple different um, uh, solutions, right? Multiple different solutions to the same problem and takes all of those solutions and adds it all together for you so you know what to expect. Then it asks them a few more questions, right? Does it change productivity? Because this is another area that we don't always calculate very well. We change injury prevent, uh, injury reduction, right? Look at injury, but we don't change uh, productivity. So with job rotation, are you expecting any productivity improvements? Well, no, because your staff will still work at the same speed, doing the exact same task. There should be no expectation that they get more efficient uh, miraculously by doing job rotation. Uh, but perhaps with the pallet lifter, uh, maybe they do, right? Maybe they, they don't have as much wasted motion. It doesn't take as much time to use. And so they ultimately do have some productivity improvements. And you can add that in here. And it is good then going to take it and estimate. So this is kind of the most interesting slide that you, or, sorry, not slide, but an interesting element of the Washington calculator is that it looks at redu estimated reduction in claims. For example, it, it gives you both options. If you implement job rotation, it expects that you'll reduce injuries by about 15%. This is what your claim cost reduction would look like. This is your indirect cost reduction, right? And then this is your annual savings over three years, over five years. The pallet lifter gives you the same information. So it says, okay, your, your job rotation is not bad. It's going to reduce claims by 15%, but your pallet lifter is going to reduce claims by 40%. So that corresponds with an injury reduction of this, uh, indirect cost of this, increase in productivity, because there is an increase in productivity element. Right? It's going to add all those in, and then looks at an estimated annual savings of about $35,000 over three years. That equates to about $100,000, and over five years, we're looking at $165,000. Right? So that's a very significant number in comparison to job rotation, which makes sense. You should expect a new piece of equipment and engineering control to have a bigger impact than job rotation. Right? But it takes into account, the nice thing about this, it takes into account that productivity element. Right? So. The Washington State Calculator, depending on what you're doing, can be a really effective way to add that in as a, as a tool or a strategy that can be helpful for you um, moving forward. So let's look at a second example from one of our clients who, again, uh, did a pretty good job of tracking some of this data. 
Um, this one is an office specific example because I thought it was important we talked about sort of a non-office but also an office piece because office ergonomics is one of those things that we still do a lot of. We get requests for office ergonomics regularly and ultimately what it comes down to is that office ergonomics also has a significant opportunity for turn on investment but we often we don't always see that. And when you look at cost per person to implement a new chair, for example, it seems like a lot of money sometimes, but it doesn't take very long for that money to get repaid if you're preventing an injury. So let's have a look at one other client example from, uh, from last year. So ultimately, this client uh, works in an office environment. So they, they are actually a manufacturer, but specifically their project was office specific. We didn't go into their manufacturing facility at all. Um, we assessed 22 workers, uh, individual workstations. Out of those 22, 18 reported discomfort. So a very significant percentage of their staff said they were not comfortable in some way. Now, they weren't necessarily out of a scale of uh, 1 to 10. We're not necessarily take, talking about a 10, right? But ultimately, uh, they had some sort of discomfort uh, at, in some body part, hand, wrist, neck, shoulder, back, whatever. The cost of the intervention in this project was approximately $17,000, and that accounts for ergonomic assessment services and write report write-ups, et cetera, support, whatever that included. So their intervention from an ergonomics perspective from hiring us cost somewhere around that $5,500 mark, and then ultimately they had new office equipment. They had um, some very old equipment, and so ultimately when we did the assessment, we found that they had a lot of gaps and they needed quite a few new things. So they had an, inter an office equipment um, requirement or recommendations totaled about 11,500. And now that data is very specific. That is actual numbers, including their uh, product discount. So they provided that number to us. They looked it all up and said, okay, if we order this product, it costs us 172.64. And we did all the math for them and calculated it all and prioritized it all. But ultimately, we were looking at about 11,500 in office equipment and 5,500 in ergonomic services. So that adds up to, what, $17,000 in intervention cost, which sounds like a lot. We're talking about dealing with 18, uh, 22 workers, so we're just about $800 or so per worker, ultimately, which does add up, and I can appreciate, especially in a manufacturer uh, or any environment, Office staff don't always seem like the highest priority. Um, and so ultimately, you're looking at this thinking, OK, that's a lot of money. I don't have like that big price tag of 17 grand seems crazy. There's no way I can afford to spend that on my office staff. I'd rather spend that money elsewhere. So let's look at the re potential return on investment they experience. Oh, and you can see in my top right-hand corner there, a breakdown of where their injuries occurred. Their highest number of injuries were their upper back and neck, followed by wrist followed by low back, and then they had some others sort of squeezed in there. But ultimately, upper back, neck, lower back, and wrist, which is pretty common um, uh, for any office environment. The one that sort of was surprising here is they didn't have a lot of shoulder pain. Uh, that's another area we see a lot of in office. Okay. So it's best here, as always, if you know your numbers, right? If you know your own specific numbers. Uh, so you know how much a shoulder injury costs in your office environment costs you, right? That's really ideal. And that's where one of the tricks that we have with us, a lot of our current clients who have sort of office and non-office environment uh, injuries is that if you lump them all together, which is fine, but if you lump them all together, sometimes your claim costs for one or the other can look inflated because it may cost more money to have an ergonomic, in, uh, to have an injury in your manufacturing facility versus in your office, right? So ideally, we know our exact numbers. We know how much a shoulder injury typically costs us, and then we can from there go ahead and take a look at, uh, and take a look at those numbers. If not, you can start to look up some data, especially when we're talking about office environment. There is some data out there, and you, can, you might have to do some research. It took us a while to find some of these numbers. Uh, this client did not have specifics uh, that we could use. So we did some average cost estimates looking at uh, statistics that were out there, all Canadian. So in the WSAB in Alberta in 2004 estimated that an average cost of a carpal tunnel injury uh, was about $12,000 to the employer. And the average cost of a back injury claim for uh, this was taken. This was an estimate done in Ontario in 2011, so more recent, was between 33 and 52 thousand dollars, depending on how long they were off, how complex, etc. And neither of these numbers account for the hidden costs like lost productivity, absenteeism, training someone new, etc. 
right? So basic numbers, very basic numbers, just using generics, are looking at about at least 12,000 for a hand wrist claim, 33 to 52,000 for a back claim, for argument's sake. So we look at this in relation to this specific client. Uh, they had five employees who reported hand or wrist injuries. So if we look at that and say, okay, there's five in employees who are reporting hand, not hand or wrist injuries, hand or wrist discomfort, which is the precursor to an injury, right? So if we had five staff saying they already had discomfort in their hand wrist without making any change, in theory, at least one, if not more than one of those, would become a claim. Right, because at some point, you know, like the old adage, you, you can't do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result, although we do it all the time. Right? If we don't change anything at their computer workstation and their discomfort is computer driven, it should progressively get worse and worse over time. So the average claim cost for a hand wrist injury, let's using that data we found online, is about twelve thousand dollars. So Ultimately, if the cost of intervention is 17000 which we knew it was, right, that we calculated that exactly, then the potential return on investment, if you prevent exactly one wrist injury, is 70%. If you prevent one, is one wrist injury, one hand wrist injury, and nothing else, the potential return on investment is about 70% of the overall intervention in the first year. And if you calculate that over two years, then obviously that jumps. 140% if you continuously prevent that one injury, right? So the potential return on investment there is really high, 70%. That would mean that they're only spending, their cost of their intervention goes down significantly, right? They may not necessarily think about it that way, but they should, right? If you take 70% away, the cost of the intervention now is only an expense of just over $5,000, right? And if you look at that on year two, they're actually now seeing a return. Back injury is more significant because those claims were actually, claim costs were actually a lot higher, right? So they actually had four in, um, uh, employees reporting back discomfort, lower back discomfort specifically, right? The average cost of those claims from that data we pulled was thirty-three dollars to $52,000. So if they prevent exactly one back injury, now they have a potential return on investment of over 200%. And that's year one. So they've already recouped plus plus their intervention costs. Right? Because if the cost of the intervention is only seventeen grand, you prevent a $33,000 injury, that's basically double uh, the return on investment. Right? You're, getting, you're making 100% of your money back. Right? So that's an interesting way to think about this as well. Right? And ideally, they would have their specific numbers in terms of average cost of claims. But this is how you start to build that business case. Why do you want to invest in office uh, ergonomics? Because ultimately, if I prevent, we have lots of staff reporting discomfort. If I prevent one injury, these are some of the numbers of what these injuries on average cost us. If I prevent one injury, then, and ideally I prevent, prevent more than that, but if I literally prevent one, then I ultimately have the potential return on investment is a lot, you know, is through the roof, right? I'm making, now I'm making money on this project rather than losing it, right? And that's how we start to build that business case. So ultimately, that's all I want to do today was take you through some of those specific case studies because we don't get them very often where we have a lot of really good numerical data. So I want to share that with everybody today. Um, so that leaves us a little earlier than normal, but that's okay. Gets everybody on their way to their next thing as the day goes on here. But just checking now to give you an opportunity to ask me any questions about any of the content in terms of the intervention, the numbers that I presented to you. What else is out there? One of the questions is about, um, just read it here, uh, in terms of the office investment, uh, we can't afford, <laughs> yes, <laughs> your problem is the same as the client's problem, which is that we can't afford to spend $17,000 all at once on our office staff. And you know what, that was actually their major concern as well, is that they got that number back with all the, re the report back with all the recommendations and breakdown in it. They started to do some quick math. Uh, and they like, created a spreadsheet essentially and said, okay, this is our, this is our problem. This is going to cost us $12,000 worth of equipment approximately. We can't afford to do all of that at once. That's crazy. And it's, def it's just not realistic for them. So they asked us if we could uh, basically take some things off the list or help them figure out how to work through it. And what we did with them is we actually prioritized uh, based on high, medium, and low risk. So if an employee, we, we, we evaluated a high, uh, like a, 
high, high need, essentially, as somebody who was having uh, significant discomfort and or was significantly off of uh, what we consider er proper ergonomic setup. So if someone, for example, got a chair recommendation, um, it could have been a high priority. It might have been a medium priority. It would have been high if they were having significant back pain, for example, uh, if, they ha if they couldn't get to the right position, like if their chair didn't adjust at all, for example, they were using one that only really adjusts for height, that would classify them as a high uh, as a high need because they ergonomically they couldn't actually find a match there. There was no way. They weren't even close. A moderate chair might have been someone who was maybe having some discomfort, likely having discomfort. That's usually the reason we recommend a chair, right? So likely having some discomfort, uh, but it was relatively minor in nature or that it was something that um, the chair adjusted in most ways and we could get them close to ideal, but we couldn't get them 100% of the way there. They were still working slightly above or below their elbow height, for example. And that's sort of how we prioritize between high, medium, and low. And we broke it down for them, saying, OK, high, meet, high tasks are one, high priorities are one are things you should get now. These are your highest likelihood of injury. You want to address these immediately to really see that return on your investment to prevent those injuries, which was the goal. Um, moderate things can probably wait six months to a year. And then low priority things or things that would be nice. Like it's nice to have a, a document holder, for example. In some cases, it's essential, depending on the type of injury. But it would be, it, you know, it's like the, the layout of their workstation or the flow of their work would lend itself to that. And so those were lower priority and were things that could wait. So they are currently in year two of this intervention uh, and would be, in theory, although we haven't heard, I haven't followed up with them just yet, but in theory, should be working through those moderate level uh, moderate level changes at this point. And ultimately, it broke their cost down pretty significantly. So that first year, they paid for the intervention. Obviously, they paid for us to come in and do all the assessments. And then they uh, it broke it down. Oh, I'm thinking it was like 60% of their equipment costs were were high priority. So in sort of year one or early year two, and then about 30%. Uh, yeah, 25 or 30 percent were in year two or moderate priority costs, and then about 10 or 15 percent were in year three. So it was a, so we were able to break it down a bit for them so that they could actually work through it. Any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anything else come up. Uh, I'll be here for just another minute. So if you do have a question, feel free to to to, to type it in there, and we'll happily I'll happily answer. Um, just so you know, 2017 webinars, aside from obviously this one, which has already been up, uh, all the other webinars will be going up online this week. So you should have um, at least until June uh, pre-scheduled as of this week. So go ahead and go online at our website, proergonomics.ca, and you can uh, register for the webinars. We are going to try a few different things this year. We've got a two-part webinar uh, series planned. So we're going to do some things. Uh, that one's actually associated with uh, anthropometrics or how the body sizes and shapes and how you use that to your advantage when you're designing something or figuring out how to lay something out in terms of what working height should you be at, what uh, reaches should you be at. So there's a two-part webinar on that. We've got, we're hoping to have a couple clients online with us just like I did today, but actually having them present some of their own statistics. So you can ask them some questions, which would be great. Um, and then we always have some tried and true favorites coming back. We'll be doing another webinar on sit stand, which is still a hot topic, and we're getting a lot of questions about still. Um, so we're trying a few new things at this point. But as always, our webinars are 100% free. They'll stay free. That's something that we feel pretty passionately about at the moment. So uh, you can join us for any or all, and you can always access them on our YouTube page after the fact. Thank you, everyone, again this more for joining me this morning. I don't see any other questions coming in, so I will uh, sign off at this point. But I hope you have a great day, and we will look forward to having you on an upcoming webinar.